I'm going to uh, begin, if that's uh, um, okay. Uh, very clearly, uh, there are still some empty seats here. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I think uh, it's partly almost like a, um, a post uh, COVID thing, people's willingness to attend actual physical sessions is um, way down, but uh, we shall uh, proceed and uh, numbers will fluctuate uh, during the, uh, the day. My name is Philip Jenkins uh, from uh, Institute for Studies of Religion, uh, ISR, directed by my colleague uh, Byron Johnson. And um, this event is on um, ancient uh, Christianities. Um, thanks for the uh, cooperation from the uh, uh, from Druid Seminary, from the uh, the religion uh, department. And let me just introduce this event in uh, very uh, very broad terms. Um, this book just appeared very recently, uh, end of last year. The uh, Cambridge History of uh, Ancient Christianity. Um, I, when I saw this was imminent, I was fascinated by it because it just touches on so many of my own uh, interests and um, enthusiasms. And then I saw who was editing it, uh, and it just seemed an absolutely natural thing for. Um, uh, uh, for an event. I am the perfect person to introduce it for this reason. I am not an editor. I am not a contributor. Uh, I haven't even carried uh, heavy boxes from one room to, uh, 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 of copies from one room to uh, another. But I do have some features that uh, qualify me here. I'm very much a, a Baylor University booster. I'm constantly amazed at how much good work is going on at this uh, university and how diverse it is across different uh, departments. Like many large universities, Baylor suffers from what you might call silo syndrome, uh, that people operate in one department and maybe don't have a great idea what's happening in other departments. And this is an absolute classic example of cooperation between uh, David Wilhite of the uh, of Fritz Emery, Bruce Longneck of the uh, religion um, department. Um, and the, the other point about it is as I read the book, and I have been spending a great time reading the book since I finally uh, managed to get uh, a copy, uh, it just offers such a wonderful opportunity to provide a survey of the state of knowledge. Now, one thing I, um, I do uh, as a, um, a theological uh, penance is um, I, I maintain a working bibliography on some aspects of this topic that are of great interest to me. Um, and those are, I know just how much appears. I know it is impossible for a book with a uh, title like this uh, to offer more than a, a survey of um, the field. But this is just such an exciting um, survey. And what I wanted to do today was um, to introduce some, uh, some themes. Um, so, oh, and um, I, I should say um, one thing. Um, I have not reviewed the book. I would not review the book. Those of you who are book reviewers know one thing. A multi-author volume is hell to review <laughs> because the one rule is you absolutely have to include everybody's name and contribution individually. And there are, what is it, 27 contributors in this? No. Um, so I'm, I'm obviously not going to be uh, touching on every, uh, uh, every topic that is here. Um, and certainly not every, uh, uh, every name, but this is just such a um, showcase of the, uh, uh, the field. And it just seemed um, natural for, um, for an event uh, uh, of, this, uh, 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 of this kind. But uh, above all, um, I want this to be a, um, a celebration of uh, first-class work and a first-class uh, book. 
Um, my, my two uh, colleagues here are much braver than I am. Uh, I long ago gave up any hope of um, uh, editing uh, collections because the odds of getting into fistfights were just too high. Um, and, uh, but b both, uh, both my colleagues here are very skilled, very diplomatic uh, figures in these editing, uh, editing enterprises. So uh, what I would like to do in this uh, first uh, session, um, certainly not, you know, give a survey of ancient Christianity, but what I would like to do is talk about some of the issues that struck me uh, from you know, my, my particular uh, idiosyncratic um, approach to, uh, 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 to a book uh, like this. When you read this, how does this book differ from what somebody else might have put together 30 years ago? Um, what, how have things changed? How are things changing? And uh, I, I should add, one of the uh, parts of the book I, uh, I, I found I kept my returning to was David's own introductory sections on a history of the history and uh, uh, different uh, uh, directions, how the history uh, has been written and uh, uh, will be written. So um, what, uh, what strikes us uh, uh, as, we, uh, as we read a book like this? Well, the first things are, uh, are negative. It is a history of ancient Christianity. It is not a history of the patristic age. Um, and, you know, what, what one can say many things about the whole idea of patristics, apart from the natural uh, uh, gender uh, balance, but w when you focus on the, um, uh, the great scholars and the great writers and the theologians and the martyrs, then you are dealing with something that focuses on um, individuals as if what they uh, what they want, what they decide, will be absorbed automatically by the uh, the rest of the Christian uh, the Christian community. What a book uh, like this does is it delves very deeply into the documents and the literature, but it also makes so much use of um, archaeology, of art, and it's a very holistic uh, uh, book in uh, in that regard. When you look at perhaps how a book like this might have been done in the past, a couple of words come to mind. Uh, such accounts would be much more um, linear. They would suggest that the story is automatically going in one uh, direction. And um, a word I've, uh, I've used a couple of times as I've uh, been thinking about this, they assume that things are going towards a natural end where they're going anyway um, and we must absolutely focus on that one direction. They are teleological. And we often see that. So for example, when you're looking at the, uh, the earliest church, um, we know that Jewish and Gentile uh, communities are going to split. Um, so th th there's almost a sense of, well, let, uh, let's get that out of the way, let's describe that nice and early so we can concentrate on the main story, which is the exact opposite of what we get in a book like this that pays such close attention to the long uh, dialogue uh, and conflict uh, within Christians and Jews over, you know, uh, uh, over several, um, uh, several centuries. By the way, uh, making that approach, um, that teleological approach, much uh, easier, um, Jewish history also tends to have a lot of the same uh, flaws. Um, it, th there was, uh, for a long time, a sense that Judaism was going to become rabbinic Judaism. There were other traditions which were denounced as, what's that very nasty phrase, sectarian Judaism. And if it's sectarian, then we don't need to bother with it that much uh, because we know it's going away. 
And so we have a, if you like, a simplified Christianity and a simplified Judaism. So, of course, they can, uh, uh, th th they can separate. What you get in a book like this is at every stage a, um, a sense of what? Multiplicity, complexity, contestation, um, and a great um, variety of, uh, uh, of voices in that way. You know, th that um, teleological uh, thing applies to lots of different uh, fields. I mean, if we look at the history of Christian doctrine, for example, uh, anyone interested in Christian history knows about the Great Councils, Council of Nicaea, um, and it's almost as if the, the um, Arians are there to uh, provide a foil to the <laughs> heroes of the story. But if you actually look at the time in the, you know, the late 350s, there are a number of councils that tend to be held at Sirmium where the Arians overwhelmingly win. And for years, it looks as if the Nicenes are going to go away uh, to be a, um, a historical footnote somewhere. And then due to imperial politics, the Nicene faction comes back, and we can explain this all in terms of the brilliant theology and rhetorical skills uh, of the Cappadocian fathers. But th th there's always a sense that um, history is meant to be going in a, um, in a particular uh, direction. Um, as I say, uh, well, uh, this is the official description of the, uh, uh, of the book, and I think that's uh, interesting. Note these ideas, multiple forms of devotion, uh, multiple phenomena, multiple permutations. Within those multiple, like numerous contests, as varieties of Christian identity lay claim to authority and authenticity in different ways. I, there, there might be a, a page in the book that doesn't focus on concepts of authority and authenticity, but I can't offhand think what it might be. Uh, these are so much the, uh, uh, the key ideas. You know, I, we, we, we think of um, pictures like this, uh, these sort of catacomb pictures, and our, um, our assumption is, you know, these are the, uh, uh, the faithful believers, and I, I sometimes like to uh, fantasize if you could get inside the minds of each individual figure what they would be thinking. And um, I, I, I'm not going to caption one of these with one person saying, I can't believe she said that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sometimes uh, tempted. So the book organizes under contestation. And, you know, in some ways, once upon a time, there might even have been a brave thing uh, uh, to do. At the moment, it is so much the most obvious, uh, natural way of, uh, 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 of approaching things. Um, and the question then arises, and again, this is on every page of the book, what are the means of contestation? How do people uh, argue? How do people establish their uh, positions? And um, again, so much of the book is about memory. It's how we remember, how that memory gives authority and authenticity in ways that are not obvious. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so the, you know, the, the very famous uh, phrase, one of the most famous uh, phrases in early Christian history is this, which is, that which is believed everywhere, always, and by all, Vincent of Lera. Um, I don't know if it ever crossed the minds of the editors to have a, um, a cover that said that which is believed in some places, <laughs> sometimes, and by some people. <laughs> You know, you, you, but what, nobody's trying to set up a sort of a Walter Bauer picture where, you know, every little community has its own ideas and then eventually the great, uh, the great church comes down and pulls them all into line. But so many of these issues are, uh, are very diverse. They're very uh, contented, contested. 
never contented. They're very uh, uh, contested. The obvious question is, how do people remember Jesus Christ? But uh, how do people remember Peter? How do people uh, remember Paul? How do they claim uh, this kind of, um, of authority? And the other word that I, uh, I found very striking running through the book was that of options. Um, instead of heresy, uh, we talk about different options. We talk about a Marcionite um, option. We talk about a Gnosticizing uh, option. I would make uh, one critical comment here to uh, uh, David Wilhite. He's written excellent, excellent books on African Christianity. But are his book covers of this quality? <laughs> would it actually hurt you to include a satanic beast? Um, good tip, no, you know, uh, uh, work on it. And again, the, the, the idea, where are we? Yeah, good. The question of um, identities, how people uh, define themselves and how they define themselves, their cultures, their, um, their, uh, their memories, and their, uh, their community. You know, again, this tends to be, that word teleological, writing the story from the end back. We know that the empire is going to be, the Roman Empire is going to be Christian at some uh, point. <clears throat> we know Christianity is going to be a mass religion. So we write about how people become Christian. Very, very fine uh, chapter in, the, uh, uh, in the, the book. I suppose... The, 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 the problem is there are so many different stages of being and becoming Christian. You know, I, I, I sometimes think if you're in a, um, a Roman city around about the year 200 and you threw a stone, you wouldn't necessarily hit a Christian, but you would be very likely to hit somebody who was either in the process of becoming one or ceasing to become one. And Christianity, like any religion, has a, a penumbra of identities, some of which are gradual and some of which are, um, are very partial. You know, if, if I look at the, uh, the, some of the very earliest Christian um, documents, it's surprising how much they've got to say about Christians who have either um, left the faith, um, or ha are in the faith for dishonest reasons. You know, the Didache talks about uh, b b b not exactly confidence men, but uh, dishonest pseudo-believers. Uh, the, the earliest uh, pagan testimony is um, Pliny's letters to uh, Trajan in 112. And he's uh, interviewed a lot of Christians, or people he believes to be Christian, and an answer he's often hearing is, well, I tried it a few years ago, it didn't work for me. Um, and the number of people who are leaving the church in any particular era is, I think, is probably quite significant. So there's a penumbra of coming in, coming out. Um, in the uh, third and fourth centuries, and why I uh, have this up, um, martyrdom is obviously a huge, huge uh, issue. Uh, is so definitive to defining how people uh, con uh, consider the church, how they establish ideas of, um, uh, uh, of authority. They write a great deal about uh, people who are tried and tortured and martyred. Uh, this is, becomes the basis of a lot of material culture in terms of uh, relics. Um, there's a far smaller literature on people who turn up, are told to sacrifice to the gods, do so, and are allowed home. Um, but, you know, there, there must be a fair number uh, of those. Um, the, 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 there is a strong lesson there, if I can coin a phrase, uh, um, badly behaved Christians seldom uh, make history. It's a, uh, it's a very selective um, approach uh, in that way. 
in, um, in years gone by, I've done quite a lot of work on um, cults and uh, new religions. And there's a big literature there which does interesting things with the whole concept of conversion. Uh, scholars of uh, religious studies in that way hate the word conversion. Conversion is something that happens on the road to Damascus. The road to Damascus uh, d does not have room for that many converts. Um, so what happens it, when there's a new religion, um, people are recruited to it voluntarily or somebody draws them in. They join. They don't know why exactly they're joining. Their commitment grows over time and they form more and more attachments within the group. And those attachments might be emotional, they might be spiritual, very often they're personal. And by the time you have more attachments within the group than outside the group, then you, you, you are in. You have not gone through a, mom a moment of, um, of conversion. And as I looked at uh, you know, the evidence we have about how people become Christian, you do get much more of this sense of the gradual. And how many of those believers must still have some connection, at least, with the, um, with the outside world, whether with uh, pagan religions or Judaism or, um, or mystery uh, religions. So you, you have more of a sense of you know, transmission and multiple um, dialogues. Something in which I've, uh, I've written, which I always um, enjoy and I, 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 I've used to annoy classes in the past, is uh, the, the, there's a wonderful second century uh, account, which you know obviously by uh, Lucian of uh, Samosata, who writes this um, satire of a uh, philosopher of the day called Peregrinus. And he does everything he can to blacken Peregrinus's name. And he has an account of how Peregrinus at one point decides it would be a good money-making enterprise uh, to join the Christian church of his day in Palestine uh, and use it as a money-making uh, enterprise. And he says something which re people over the centuries have loved, which was not only did he um, become a great interpreter of the Christian sacred books, but he actually wrote some which people still read to this day. And in the 19th century, people used to say, oh, what can we include in that category? Uh, you don't have to believe any of that. But what, what's interesting, what people tend not to note about that is the language he uses for the, um, the Christians is entirely technical language from the mysteries. Um, and he, he, this is in a uh, Christian Gentile context in Palestine. How much did he actually know? I, I would actually argue that he, he knew at least some of the Christians, uh, Lucy knew some of the Christian scriptures. Um, but, you know, sh how much can you take from a, a ruthless parody? Well, you have to be very, very careful. But it is interesting, that is, that is kind of one uh, possible uh, view. Moving to something I'm also very um, interested in, and I, I, it just framed the questions I was asking uh, throughout the book in so many different sections. One of the biggest uh, fields in the study of ancient religion these days is that of lived religion. Um, and lived religion basically says, you know, uh, don't spend so much time looking at the, uh, the mythologies and the scriptures, focus on how people um, actually live, what, what do they do. Um, and, uh, you know, this is now a very active uh, field. Um, the, uh, uh, the Bible uh, for this in a modern context, if you'll pardon the expression, is uh, uh, Nancy Ammerman's Studying Lived Religion. It's a you know, terrific book. But there's also the uh, very large school of lived uh, ancient religion. Uh, Jörg Gripke is the, probably the, uh, the best known. Religion is understood as a spectrum of experiences, actions, beliefs, and communications 
hinging on human interaction with superhuman or transcendent agents, yet, yet, material symbols, elaborate forms of representation, and ritualization are called upon for the success of communication with these addressees. Well, that is very broadly uh, used to describe lived ancient religion of whatever kind. It's also the background from which people are coming when they move into a Christian society, a Christian community. Um, how much are they bringing in? How much does that affect their expectations of what they want to get from the, uh, the new religion? And they, um, what they want partly is divine figures or holy figures that they can use and um, identify uh, with. Um, and what are use, called usable gods. Um, I love this picture, by the way. I, I love to use this in, um, in class. Um, it, it, it is, in some ways, it's multiply annoying. It's, a, it's an 1890s painting by Waterhouse called Consulting the, uh, uh, the Oracle. It's a very famous picture. And right away, you can see problems with it in terms of it's very Orientalist. Uh, it's based on these ideas of these, uh, uh, you know, superstitious, gullible women. But at the same time, uh, it, it's a great teaching uh, tool because it gets into so many of the uh, fields of lived religion that have been so, had such an impact on parts of the study of uh, Christianity in um, recent uh, decades. One is the history of uh, the emotions, the history of the um, the history of the senses, um, how, wh what are the practical differences in terms of what people do um, between different uh, different religious uh, traditions, and the other one that. Uh, is so important is that of um, embodiment. Embodiment is um, what people actually uh, do in religious life. Um, how does it affect their bodies and their postures and, um, and so on? So by, by the time people have stopped being, um, being shocked by this painting, you can actually get into some good questions. Um, some of the most interesting lived religion approaches on Christianity uh, look at the phenomena of, oh, uh, trances, um, ecstasies, uh, you know, uh, 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 out-of-the-body uh, uh, states, uh, and so on. And there's a very good, uh, there's a very good uh, literature uh, there. In terms of um, usable uh, usable gods. Well, obviously, there's a uh, very large literature on Christian and uh, Jewish um, amulets. Uh, this is a very straightforward one. We know what this one was for. This one was to be folded. It's meant to be for, uh, for good, good luck. You, you never can be quite so sure with uh, some examples of what look like um, examples of, um, uh, of scripture. Um, but Christianity is has to provide usable um, figures. Um, one of the books I have been most struck by in the last couple of years on this whole era um, is, um, is Robin Jensen's uh, From Idols to Eight Guns, which I think is an absolutely magnificent uh, book. But it's about the um, origins of that Christian material, visual culture between what, the fourth and the uh, uh, and sixth century. And her whole point is, no, this is not a case of um, the Christian church collaborating with paganism. It's, and it's following its own internal logical development in terms of representations of the holy. Um, but that obviously has such a, uh, such a big impact, must have had a huge impact on getting Christianity among ordinary, um, ordinary people, about stages of, I was about to use that word, uh, conversion. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. 
uh, increasing adherence, increasing attachments uh, to the faith in what's still uh, largely a, um, a pagan um, society. And one of the things that strikes me in terms of uh, that lived religion approach, and again, um, something that I see uh, uh, so much of the, uh, the literature, is the st steadily growing influence and presence of female figures in that Christian worldview in the early centuries. Now, you know, there, there, there's a very common idea that, uh, you know, earliest Christianity is this very radical idea, uh, very uh, scornful of gender boundaries, and later on it becomes more um, patriarchal and uh, male-dominated, and, you know, fine. But in terms of popular devotion, popular piety, one of the most important things that happens between the end of the first century and the sixth <clears throat> is the growth of the Virgin Mary, above all, to be an absolutely central figure in uh, the Christian world. Um, already in the what, second quarter of the second century, uh, you have basically a gospel which is already drawing very close parallels between the Virgin Mary uh, and Jesus. Uh, those stories accrete and grow. Um, I'm reluctant to say this in Dr. Jensen's uh, presence. I think the first Marian apparition I've seen a reference to would be, what, mid-third century, and they become much more common uh, after that. Uh, the, the passing of the Virgin is a massive theme of uh, writing and visual depictions certainly from the 5th century uh, on. You know, I, I, I've had some uh, interesting conversations here with um, people who uh, believe in the, uh, the scriptures and early tradition and the uh, uh, ages of the, uh, the councils and so on. Uh, if you go up to about the time of Chalcedon in 451, and look at the church that um, approves the Council of Chalcedon, it is a very Marian church indeed, and also a church where monasticism uh, has become very strong. Um, in those terms, the church becomes very Catholic very early, um, but those um, feminine images are just, um, are just so strong. And if you're about to say, well, those, those Gospels, they never canonized, they never included in Scripture. No, they're certainly not. But does it really make that much difference if people are uh, reading them and copying them and they're having such an afterlife uh, and such a very wide story right the way up to the Reformation? Yeah, once again, are they thinking, the, uh, thinking of the same things? I had a couple of other uh, thoughts here um, about ways in which we tell uh, the story and some ways in which people do such a impressive job in the, um, in the Cambridge history. Um, I, I always like that uh, map. It's a map from around the year uh, 1500, and it shows the standard divisions of the world as they were viewed um, at that time. Uh, there are three great land masses, Europe, Asia, and Africa. They have their center at Jerusalem, which is the seat of the sacred drama. And uh, each of those um, continents has got 12 lands. Everything is wonderfully organized and symmetrical. And then in the corner, you've got, oh yeah, Somebody just discovered America. <laughs> Stand by, we'll figure it out at some point. And you're about to ask, probably, my word, I'm glad I wasn't sailing on a ship where they were using things like that for maps. And that's right, but they used these symbolic maps, and they also had very, very finely detailed actual charts for, uh, for sailing. The geography 
of early Christianity is a very interesting topic uh, for me. Um, if you look at the earliest church before about 300, then you can identify most writings from a fairly limited number of places and the regions around them. Uh, so, you know, you have the uh, um, you have five great cities, you have Rome, Carthage, Antioch, Edessa, uh, Alexandria. Uh, you have some writings coming from Lyon, you have, um, sorry, Ephesus, pardon me. Um, you, you have some writings coming from uh, Jerusalem, from uh, Lyon, from, uh, from Edessa. And you think, well, wonderful, that's the Christian world. And then you think, well, the, there's one actually very large part of this that not just don't we know about, but we never can know about. There's um, a phrase I, uh, I've seen quoted in a couple of different ways, which is in the West, Christianity has lost its history. And uh, above all in Spain, um, as far as we can tell, the uh, evidence for very early Christian communities in southern Spain is comparable to that more or less anywhere around the, the empire. We have basically nothing written from the greater metro area of Cordoba. Uh, we have um, some very important martyrdoms up the coast and Tarasco. But that whole Cordoba world, that whole southern Spain world, is invisible until round about uh, uh, not long after 300, when two things happen, which is you get the uh, Synod of Elvira, which appears to be the uh, template and mold for a very large amount of later synods and church councils. And when Hosius of Cordoba emerges as the de facto leader of the Western Church uh, at, um, uh, uh, at the councils around uh, the time of Nicaea, something is happening there. And not just do we not know what it is, we can't know what it is unless somebody's going to wander in a, 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 a cave in the hills of southern Spain and come up with a lot of manuscripts we're not, um, we don't know are there uh, yet. I just offer you this map. Um, I, I, I think this is wonderful. If you have a look at maps of the uh, Roman Empire and its communications, they're fairly complicated. Somebody got a brilliant idea of doing it as a London uh, subway map. And you look at it, and for, for the first time, you, you see, I suddenly see why some of those cities are there. And you see the place, how places communicate. And uh, one of my um, favorite examples here, and this is something I've, um, I, I will be writing more about, uh, from um, Byzantium uh, to uh, Durazzo and the Adriatic, you've got something running uh, called the Via Ignatia. Uh, this great Roman road. Um, if, if you have a, um, a particularly bright student who wants to write a great book, tell him to write a religious history of the Via Ignatia. Um, from uh, Paul's uh, time, um, right, the way, uh, uh, right the way through um, the Middle Ages, right the way through the <coughs> spread of um, Balkan, Bulgarian heresies uh, into the West in the uh, 11th and 12th um, centuries, and a history in the Ottoman Empire right up until fairly uh, modern, modern times, um, of, uh, Sufi orders and uh, so on. That's one. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, am I saying this is impeccable history? Not necessarily. But it's the sort of thing which is a great teaching tool. You look at it, and you suddenly see connections that weren't there before, at least in my mind. Um, and you, you also, if, if, if you map the Spanish roads, uh, you also get a great uh, map of um, all, uh, all the main recorded martyrdoms in Spain. Uh, so and just a, an area of some interest uh, to me. Andrew Walls was a very great scholar of uh, global Christianity. 
he, uh, he's famous for many things, uh, not least his comment uh, that if you were interested in the Christianity of the second century, you could do one of two things. You could invent a time machine or buy an air ticket to contemporary Africa. Um, and he wrote a rather wonderful short essay called Eusebius Tries Again, which I heartily commend to you. It's absolutely brilliant. It starts off in Jerusalem, of course, and then uh, follows the spread of the uh, church um, through the Red Sea into Syria, into, uh, into Mesopotamia, into Persia. Um, and it takes our standard westward orientation of the church spread and makes it um, eastern. And you know, th th there are certainly Christian communities in India by the end of the first century uh, and quite substantial um, th uh, uh, thereafter. He pulls that together so, uh, so well. But one thing that uh, he stresses, and uh, you know, I do this a lot, but, and I fully acknowledge my debt to Walls uh, on this, he is so strong on the border buffer states between the Roman Empire and the Parthian, later the Sasanian Empire. You have the Roman world, which is one thing. You have the Eastern worlds, which uh, you know change their borders considerably. But you have these border states, like what? Uh, Osroeni, with its capital at uh, Edessa. Uh, Armenia, Adiabene, with its capital at um, Arbella. Um, you also have um, a couple uh, in well, the fifth century, uh, a, a, a couple of very strong Arab kingdoms there, the uh, Hassanids and the Lachmids. And each of those is going to be absolutely critical, not just for preserving different kinds of Christianity that are being persecuted elsewhere, preserving manuscripts, preserving traditions. Um, they serve as refuges for, uh, for people. And uh, I'm, I'm very much following walls there. So much of important stuff that happens in early Christianity happens through those uh, through those areas, you know, I'm, I, I've been very interested in the uh, survival of some very ancient scriptures into the um, the, the Middle Ages. So th this is a familiar story, but just okay. Um, in the nineteenth century, um, Russian and Slavic scholars were reading. Uh, these medieval manuscripts, and they found this very bizarre religious stuff, and they said, what on earth is this? Well, long story short, um, obviously a lot of very ancient Jewish books and manuscripts, some of which were very dualist, had survived into the Middle Ages long enough to be translated into Slavonic languages, and they became what we call the Slavonic pseudepigrapha. Okay? Um, and Th these are things from the time when the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. They represent sectarian Judaism. <laughs> and a question then arises between being in uh, first century Palestine and 14th century Muscovy, where the hell were they? And where could things like this be preserved in such a way that they're not going to be instantly burned? And you look very hard at these, um, these border kingdoms. You look at uh, Armenia, and then later on they, uh, uh, they, they, move, uh, they can move west. But the survival of many of manuscripts like that, and manuscripts like them, are absolutely baffling, unless you assume that there is relatively safe space in what we would call the, uh, the early Middle Ages where the local bishop is not going to make them the basis of a bonfire. So I suppose my own interests um, are in the, 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 spread of the, uh, the spread of the faith. And possibly in the first thing I said in this presentation, I, uh, I said something 
uh, which was wrong and dumb. And you might say, first of many, but wrong and dumb. Because I, I, I said, people knew the empire was going to be Christian. Always a good question to ask, which empire? Because, of course, the, the Persian Empire also provides a mold, a template, that is going to provide a great basis for the church after the empire itself crumbles in almost exactly the same ways. Uh, they use roads, they use communication systems, they use cities. So, you know, the, the story has to be east, uh, east and west. Um, so, ge geography interests me. And um, I had one other major nagging point, and this has kind of got to me more and more as I've been interested in some of these topics uh, through, the, uh, through the years. Um, I don't know what is ancient. And I, I don't know when ancient uh, ends. Um, you know, there, there, there was a great time in life when um, uh, you could date the day in, um, in 476 when the Western Roman Empire uh, collapsed and people said, well, Middle Ages is going to start very, very promptly. And if there's one thing we know from about 50 years of uh, scholarship, it's that you have a period called late antiquity, which runs from about 200 to, when do you want, 900, 1,000, depending where and when, which is separate from the earlier era, which is not yet fully a new and different world, which is, in many ways, a freestanding uh, era. And there are very observable trajectories from the third century through about the ninth. I recently wrote a book about iconoclasm in uh, eighth and uh, ninth century Byzantium. You read some of the uh, arguments there, and people will refer, they're right in 750, and they're right about what happened at the Council of Chalcedon in 450, as if it was the previous week. And you also get a sense that the Christology debates that you think of from that earlier era are still going full blast into the, uh, into the, eighth, and, uh, into the eighth and ninth centuries. Um, and I, I never know exactly what, uh, uh, what to do um, with that, except to say, I used to be a much better informed person. I used to know when the ancient world ended. I don't anymore. Um, I used to know that uh, the story of Christianity was a story that spread into the Roman Empire. Yes, and. And uh, I suppose my great uh, symbol for that last statement is when the, um, the greatest uh, library of the world, the greatest uh, Christian library in the uh, eighth century is uh, in the city of Merv in what is now Turkmenistan. And it is uh, trying to translate all the documents, all the great Christian literatures uh, that they'll need to spread to the East and ultimately with the great goal of reaching China. And they, they have all these documents, mainly Syriac, lot of Coptic, lot of Greek. You know how many Latin documents they translate? One. And you think, they, they have a definite, they've decided not to decide here. There, there, is, a, uh, there is a definite uh, view. So what, what I'm, I suppose what I'm saying here is, I cannot tell you how much I owe already in the few months I've had it to this uh, Cambridge history. I have learnt so much from it, and I'm going to pay it the ultimate tribute. It has set off so many lines of inquiry that it may not confront directly, but it raises questions, and that to me is the greatest compliment um, I know how to make. Um, so, 
I think this is going to be regarded as a, if you like, a landmark, a state of, um, a state of the art at an absolutely uh, uh, critical uh, time. And uh, when you are doing the, uh, uh, the new edition in 20 years, I'm sure it'll be a very, a very different thing. But um, as I said, is that a, uh, is that a review of the, uh, the book? No, it is a list of questions uh, raised. And um, there will be a, a, a great deal more uh, uh, to say um, by our next speaker, uh, Dr. Longnecker, and I have an image of him here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, <my> better days. <laughs> please. Um, so what I, I, I'm going to do, um, I'm, I'm going to throw open for any kind of uh, immediate kind of questions or protests or um, contestations uh, uh, or whatever. And then in a few minutes, we will uh, hand, uh, hand over to, uh, uh, to yourself. Um, I, I hope you think that was a, uh, uh, a fair reading or response. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I thought it was very complimentary or flattered. So um, on myself, on behalf of Bruce, too, thank you very much for this response. God, maybe I could just start it off with a very specific question uh, before we get into wider discussions. So that concept of live religion, I've, I've, I've heard of this and kind of uh, yeah. keep seeing it pop up, but I never looked into sort of the standard bibliography on this. I wonder if you could give us just a very brief genealogy of it. Is this yeah. any way related to, like, Clifford Garrett's thick description? Okay. Yeah, um... What you might call parallel evolution. Okay, this goes back to French sociology of the 1950s and 60s. And you've got to remember, these guys are living in a Catholic society with Catholic tradition, and so there's a distinction between uh, 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 what's called uh, religion prescrite, prescribed religion, and religion vécu, lived religion. Okay, and the whole point is. Um, what, how people live religion is often totally different. So you can uh, look at what, uh, what people are supposed to be doing, and it's totally different from the prescribed. And the great example I would give you, through most of Islamic history, what Muslims do is they, um, they go to uh, shrines where um, women touch holy images in the hope of becoming pregnant, um, and where there's music and dancing, and what part of the Quran is this in? Oh, wait, none. Um, and so it's lived religion. By the way, that looks identical to a lot of early medieval Christian shrines. And that's not influence. It's just that's the way we're naturally uh, wired. If you read Nancy Ammerman's uh, Studying Lived Religion, it'll give you a great, great survey. And one reason she is so important is most of her early work was specifically on evangelical congregations and Baptist congregations. Um, and her point was there were a lot of these congregational studies where people would live in a congregation for uh, a year. Um, and the picture they gave of what people were actually thinking and doing really had very little to do with prescribed uh, religion. And that's really been what I would only call a religious revolution in the last 25 years in terms of how it's, um, how it's taught and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, but very, um, uh, very important. And the ancient religion, uh, Jörg Grübke there, is uh, by far the best known name, and he's published a lot. But there are a lot of other people, mainly on Roman and uh, Greek, but they'll also do, you know, Babylonian. There's a very good literature on uh, the biblical uh, Old Testament world of uh, lived religion. So a uh, real major kind of uh, field to... Uh, within Robin, is that a fair, uh, a fair summary there? Or, uh, I, I think it's something, I mean, it's a, sort of what we were talking about in terms of thinking, I mean, I think you do it without really thinking about it. Yeah. What, are, what are the practices that people are following? Sure. Which would include ritual practices, liturgy, other things that we, you know, we come back to thinking about what we need to talk about in the history of Christianity. Ancient Christianity is more than what the texts are telling us. Right. So how do you get at the, all the other practices right. and the lived, the lived, the lived Christianity of not just ordinary people, but everybody, right? So, 
And it also means tearing down a lot of uh, familiar distinctions. So here is respectable religion, here is superstition. Mm. And uh, those lines change over time. And, um, by the way, so much of Reformation movements in any religion uh, consists of doing a list of all the lived religious practices that have come up and deciding, no, 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 we have to be back to basics. Well, I mean, it almost would say the Reformation, sometimes they used to teach it, is actually yeah. a Reformation of lived religion. Of course it's it is. Almost purely sacramental, hardly at all theological right. in some ways. I mean, yeah. And, you know, um, I would say the most important things that happen in terms of regular life in the, uh, in the Reformation it's not when people publish books, but when they go out into the churches and smash all the images. Um, iconoclasm was so fundamental to, uh, uh, to the Reformation. The whole baptismal practice. Sure. Oh, by the way, also a very strong gender element, because one of the things they're doing is smashing any image of a woman in that church. Hmm. You know, uh, Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene. All the saints. <laughs> Um, all the saints, but above all, and a great example of it, by the way, if you ever go to Ely Cathedral in England, there's an absolutely gorgeous ghost of a chapel called the Lady Chapel, which is this magnificently uh, painted, carved um, chapel dedicated to the Virgin Mary, the Lady, and everything, every head has been smashed off, it's been whitewashed, we don't have any color, too much lived religion here. It's a very, very important uh, topic, and like I say, specifically lived ancient religion is a huge topic right now in the last, uh, last few years. And uh, where, where are the boundaries? And it, 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 you know, pure speculation. You wonder how many, how much of the bishop's time is devoted to uh, telling the Christians uh, uh, he, uh, uh, under him, you can do that, don't do that. Drawing lines. Uh, other thoughts? Well, well, yeah. Just to say, um, there was um, there was some idea to uh, to including in the volume um, Ramsey McMullen's distinction. I'm winking um, between uh, the. The, what, what would he say? The first church and the second church, yeah, yeah. and he would give percentages to the the church. The first church is about five percent, I think, and the, led by the laity, they are the ones that gather within the interior of the churches. Whereas, the rest of the populace who can't fit in are they're they're just out in the out in the out in the graveyards doing paganism with the uh, with the veneer of Christianity over it. Um, I mean, that would be. Uh, regardless of your take on it, that would be a, a, a lived a lived religion sure. uh, a, a sort of interpretation of what's going on. Um, but since we're there, um, do you have ideas on uh, Ramsey McMullen uh, on that? On that, or you don't want to get into yeah, yeah. Uh, get into that? And, yeah. You know, my my, my question. Um, as I said, I'm very interested in this, uh, uh, in this lived uh, uh, religion thing. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a, a book here long. Um, and I, I, I'm really working a lot on that right now, but I, I sort of have too much to say at this, uh, uh, at this stage. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was thinking about that, and I, I think it often it's just a very common sense sort of thing, if you yeah. think about it. I mean, I can only speak for Catholics for the moment. <laughs> and Protestants are much more educated about their own faith, actually. Um, of Catholics of catechism, but you know, right, right. <laughs> but you know, if you sit in a pew and you think, what, what, what do other people think next to me think is going on here? It might be completely different from the next person over and the next person over, and they're also shaped by everything around them, yeah. even if they're unconsciously shaped by all the, the stained glass windows or the walls or the setup of the altar or the space or the how long the center aisle is or, or who is in front and what they're wearing. I mean, all of that is not really the written text. It's actually the visual text, the, the experience, the practice text that they're, they're getting. And they get funny ideas from it sometimes, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is actually pretty interesting. And I think it's what we don't count for is that it's so variable. Mm -hmm. it just it, even from person to person. Yeah. But you know, 
you, uh, you said one interesting thing there, you're thinking about being uh, in church, and you know, you re really learn a lot about embodiment and what people actually do in terms of bodily gestures. But a lot of the lived religion literature is about other things that people do that are impossible to define except as religion. Yeah. How about the belief in Santa Claus? How about Halloween? Uh, how about uh, er uh, erecting a, uh, a Christmas tree? Um, and you know, <laughs> yeah, well, um, wh when is something uh, when is something religious? And, and, and by the way, people talk about um, you know, oh, he's uh, spiritual but not religious. And from a lived religion perspective, the question is, what is it? Well, what does that mean? That's a distinction without a difference. Um, but it's a, um, it's an interesting, it's a, a, it's a very important topic. And you know, you could you could argue that uh, one of the big things that happens in the shift to early medieval Christianity uh, is that churches become much more willing to approve these pop a lot of these popular lived uh, practices, and, uh, um, which, as as I would say, uh, often have a strong feminine element. I think there's a big gender element uh, in uh, uh, in all this. Um, but uh, uh, well worth uh, well worth looking at, I think. So I was sort of asking about the genealogy of yeah. where this particular methodology yeah. come yeah. from, because it does. It, I mean, I think it's probably become the predominant way of talking about ancient Christianity today. So much so, we were mentioning this earlier. I'll, I'll just mention this in my uh, lecture later. So much so that I mean, within the discipline, there's almost no room for any sort of tracing of history of ideas or theological theology or doctrine. Um, because we need to, we already know that. Let's get behind, let's get behind that to what the lived experiences were, was of most Christians. That's very interesting, and, yeah. and I'm I'm for that. I think that's a very healthy uh, correction, course correction. But I, I wonder things like uh, how important catechism became. I mean, a three-year catechism yeah. before baptism. I mean, that has to spend a lot of time saying, <laughs> not that lived religions, or not the you know not the false interpretation. Here's the right interpretation. I'd just be curious to. If that's if that's an interesting intersection point between those yeah. two, yeah, is, how much fighting? How much we really know about the fights between yeah. orthodox definitions of things, for example? Right. It's is it Gregory Nazianzus has this famous line: "Every time you go buy bread, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. are you homoousios or homoousios? You know. <laughs> so I mean, the barber. Every time you want a haircut, he's asking you about. You know. So um, allegedly, everyone's interested in these discussions. But yeah. I'd, so I'd, I'd just be curious about the. How to, how to connect the two, or how to, how to see the tension or intersection. No, I'll give you one example, which actually isn't from Christianity, it's from Judaism, uh, very much at the same sort of time. I recently did a book about uh, Psalm 91, which is uh, a huge source of um, amulets. And you realize, um, um, uh, for Jewish and Christian communities, and they're actually very similar parallel development. And all over, Mesopotamia, all over Syria, you get these uh, uh, Jewish areas where people have got uh, long amulet inscriptions written on bowls and they're buried in the corner of the room. I'm prepared to bet that every rabbi who we have quoted in the Talmud in the fifth and sixth centuries is writing in a room that's got a bowl with an inscription written uh, uh, buried by the door. Um, and most of the time, they don't even talk about it. But when they do, it's, well, pff, yes. <laughs> you know, you can deal with demons if you want. Um, and it's just great, a great example of, of the, um, what, what seems to us a very odd mix between, pardon the air quotes, superstition uh, and, you know, very exalted legal and religious thought. Um, but it, you know, um, it doesn't strike them. I wonder if one of, your, one of the things that you could look at is the sort of big movement, as you would know, towards this whole question of identity, which yeah. has gotten very popular. Mm -hmm. of course. And David Frankfurter's recent book, for example, the big one on Egypt, yep. um, but also Eric Rebier's littler book on the Christian and the many identities. And there's a, I think there's a kind of debate there. You know, how much do people actually understand and identify and at what points do they get very fierce about their identities, and at other points do they kind of lax about them? 
or, you know, it, it, I always say you get along with your, I get along with my Orthodox Jewish neighbors just fine. I, get, I go to their house for Sabbath dinners and uh, things, but when the time comes and they start put, putting up certain kinds of yard signs, then I get upset, you know, so, <laughs> you know, there's a limit to my, to my open-mindedness, you know, or inclusion. Um, yeah. And, um, and those things can spill over into uh, uh, sorts of things. They can spill over into uh, understandings of the history of the senses, of embodiment, of things that you don't see. Um, you know, you can actually write a whole history of Christian Islamic relations over about a thousand years as a war for control of the soundscape as to who's allowed to have bells and who's allowed to have the, uh, the imam preaching. Um, and literally, a lot of people die of those issues of the soundscape. And uh, are they fighting about theology? No, they're fighting for the noise that goes around the streets. Try explaining that. Okay. Um, well, uh, our next uh, speaker, we're a couple of minutes early, it does not matter. Bruce Longenecker, and I will just read the inscription. He holds the W.W. Melton Chair of Religion and is Professor of Christian Origins at uh, Baylor. Um, he has uh, uh, written, co-written, or edited more than uh, two dozen books, including In Stone and Story, Early Christianity in the Roman World, and Greco-Roman Associations, Deities, and um, Early uh, uh, Early Christianity, and is also uh, co-editor of uh, uh, the book we are uh, discussing. May I please ask you to uh, come on down? Okay. I'll take a minute. Okay, well, um, thank you for coming, and especially thanks to Philip Jenkins for putting this day together. Uh, he had the vision for it and, uh, uh, and had the initiative and, the, and, and put the resources of ISR behind it, so we're very thankful for that, uh, Philip. Uh, thanks so much. So, looking in the rearview mirror, the Cambridge History of Ancient Christianity in the Making. Um, the volume um, uh, came together something like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, in March 2016, uh, Beatrice Reel, who is the publishing director in the Humanities and Social Sciences at Cambridge University Press, uh, approached me to see if she could land the editing of a volume on early Christianity at my doorstep. Um, full disclosure here, Beatrice had been sent my way by the New Testament scholar Paul Trebilco, uh, who suggested me for this editing role, so let the hearer understand I was not the first choice. <laughs> um, as I worked on the vision for the volume with Beatrice, uh, it became clear both to her and to me that her preference was to commission a volume that dealt with Christian origins up to the fourth century, culminating with the Council of Nicaea in 325. So from Galilee to God, we might say, or from, the, uh, from crucifixion to council. Um, around this time, Beatrice also gave the volume its title, uh, The Cambridge History of Ancient Christianity. Because the volume was to cover some 300 years of history, I told Beatrice that I would need a co-editor uh, for my own deficiencies in this project, and of course she agreed. It was not hard for me to, for me to decide who I needed uh, in the co-editor's role. Uh, David Wilhite, professor of historical theology at Truett Seminary, uh, a first-rate scholar with ri wide-ranging interests, a sharp historical and theological eye, and a strong work ethic. Although I had some rough ideas about the content and shape of the volume, it was when David came on board that the vision for the volume went to a new level. But uh, ahead of us was the considerable task of putting together a proposal for the book to be submitted to Cambridge University Press for peer review. Our proposal was 11,000 words in length. Four assessors commented on the volume, and as par for the course, we were asked to take account of their comments in a revised proposal. At the end of the process, we got the green light to move ahead with putting the volume together. David and I started moving forward with real intent in the spring of 2017, about a year after Beatrice's first email. 
That spring, we reached out to a number of scholars, giving them the vision for the volume and proposing that they join the project by writing an article on a particular topic that we were suggesting for them. With the article submission deadline set for the 1st of August 2020, we were hopeful that the volume might appear in 2021 or 2022 at the latest. Um, seven and a half years after Beatrice's first email, the volume emerged in November 2023, uh, one or two years beyond the hope for, hoped for publication date. Of course, the COVID pandemic slowed things down along the way and affected things here or there. Uh, and the task of compiling the indexes for this monster volume of almost 3, uh, 300,000 words uh, took a daunting four or five months of cross-eyed work. Mm -hmm. This work was masterfully carried out by one of our graduate students in the Department of Religion, Eric Brewer, who's here today, uh, who, has, uh, who had also done much of the initial editing of the essays, along with three other excellent graduate students from Truett, Bobby Martinez, Mandy Becker, and Solomon uh, Svela. In uh, almost every uh, way imaginable, it was a case of slow but steady progress. Having an excellent co-editor made the process enjoyable for me, including our uh, occasional editorial lunches, um, and Beatrice was a pleasure to work with uh, at every point. Moreover, along the, along the way, I learned a great deal from our first-rate contributors. So, what then about the character of the volume? Our goal for this project was not to do a coverage volume where the reader is introduced to anything and everything of relevance in the study of ancient Christianity, nor did we want to fill gaps evident in other volumes. We wanted instead to look at issues that had received attention in recent years and to foreground those issues in particular. We couldn't hit them all, but we hit over two dozen of them. Readers of the volume will note that Czech, if we can refer to it as that, uh, was not, uh, in fact, framed as a study of early Christianity up to the Council of Nicaea. Beatrice kindly humored me in my resistance to that idea. To sail the pre-Constantinian seas and then finally dock at Nicaea could potentially skew things in a certain teleological direction of the kind that Philip was mentioning earlier, as if to imply that the whole of ancient Christianity was all going in that direction all along, theologically speaking. But at the same time, contributors to the volume would need to have some editorial guidance regarding the time span of their considerations. So we ask contributors of the volume to consider their assigned topics in relation to the gestures of toleration initiated in the early fourth century by the imperial tetrarchs, Constantine and other co-reigning emperors. With those imperial initiatives of 311 and 313 in particular, the Tetrarchs fostered religious tolerance throughout the empire, largely putting an end to the persecution of Christians that followed in the wake of initiatives undertaken by Emperor Diocletian in 303. So as David articulates the point so effectively, the volume uses those initiatives of imperial toleration, that so-called Constantinian shift, um, as a mile marker rather than as a necessary boundary marker for contributions. That is, our authors were allowed to negotiate that mile marker as they deemed most appropriate to their subject matter. To elaborate, in some respects, the Constantinian era was significantly different to the pre-Constantinian era, while in other, uh, in other aspects, that is not the case. Much depends on what you're looking at. So on the one hand, much of the so-called proto-Orthodox theological discourse of the pre-Constantinian era meshes well with the theological discourse of Orthodox theologians in the Constantinian era of Nicaea and beyond. One barely needs to blink to get from the theological discourse of Tertullian in the late second and early third century to the pronouncements of the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople in the fourth century. On the other hand, the Constantinian era put Christian architecture and art on steroids. 
with regard to Christian material culture, what was happening in 310 has much more in common with what was happening in 210 than with what was happening in 410. Arguably, the sizable developments in Christian architecture and art that were underway by the end of the fourth century were fostered more by the political pronouncements of toleration articulated by the imperial tetrarchs prior to Nicaea than by the theological declarations of Nicaea themselves. So it would seem that the way the Constantinian shift is uh, navigated depends largely on the issue under consideration. Also to be considered was the issue of conceptualizing the different tradents of Christianity or Christianities within that early period. To get a sense of this, I'll quote part of an email that David and I sent to potential contributors when asking if they would join the project. After introducing the general purpose of the volume, we said this, here greatly condensed. Uh, the early, uh, sorry, early Christian theological discourses and identities were coalescing around a variety of gravitational centers, some with more centripetal pull than others. Consequently, the cont contributions within this volume should exhibit something of a middle way between the traditional approach of postulating binary opposites of so-called orthodoxy and heresy and the revisionist approach in which all forms of diversity are given equal weight. The aim is for each article to address key topics in the study of early Christianity while accounting for the complexity of and fluidity within early Christianity or Christianities. <laughs> In the opening paragraph of the editor's preface articulated the point this way, within the term ancient Christianity lie multiple forms of devotion to Jesus Christ, multiple phenomena, uh, multi phenomena, multiple permutations in the formative period of Christian history. With those, within those multiples lie contests as, very, as, as varieties of Christian identity lay claim to authority and authenticity in different ways. So we structured the volume in terms of six kinds of contestations. In the first section of the book, uh, contested contexts. Um, this includes essays that explore how histori historiography um, has been and is being carried out in contested or divergent ways. Uh, in the second, entitled Contested Figures, uh, contributors consider ancient competitions to align Jesus, Peter, and Paul with various ideological programs within early Christianities. Contested Heritage contains essays giving thought to how early Christ followers legitimated their various theological programs in relation to inherited structures of cultural power. Uh, the essays in Contested Cultures position early Christ followers in relation to socioeconomic, political, and material realities of their day. In Contested Beliefs, our authors look at diversities of theological and ecclesiastical or ecclesiological uh, convictions held by Christ followers of this period. And contributors to the sixth section, Contested Bodies, probe the way Christ followers navigated in various ways the realities of sexualized, uh, enslaved, or impoverished bodies, as well as the relationship of the deceased body and the soul, or the bi-directional interactions between the deceased and the living. A few other topics were originally envisaged for the project, but for whatever reason, the contributions failed to materialize, leaving David and me uh, having to decide how to slightly reshape the volume in its final version. But one way or another, the volume testifies to the vibrancy of some of the recent work being done in the study of ancient Christianity. In fact, David's two opening essays to the volume illustrate that it is an exciting time to work in the field of early Christian studies. For the time uh, remaining to me, I would like to focus on one area that has seen significant development in the past eight or so years in particular, 
and that is uh, Greco-Roman associations as providing heuristic comparanda for interpreting early Christ groups. Uh, but this is also what I call my sin of omission. Uh, when David and I configured our ideal table of contents for Chak back in 2016, I had no real sense that the topic of Greco-Roman associations and early Christ groups was going to, to develop so rapidly and so significantly in such a short period of time. Back then, this area of study still looked less like a growth area uh, than a peripheral interest. I'll introduce the topic momentarily, but for now, I simply need to register how very much things have changed in the last few years. By my count, since 2016, the publications in this field, uh, without counting articles, comes to five monographs, four collections of essays, three volumes collecting associational inscriptions and papyri, with three more emerging in the near future, and three reprints of earlier monographs, two from 2003 uh, and one from 2011. Moreover, there are now three extensive online databases allowing anyone to dig around in associational data to do their own research with ease. Obviously then, there has been a flurry of activity uh, in this field even in the past eight years. Meanwhile, here at Baylor, in the past uh, two years, uh, two PhDs, uh, two PhD dissertations have already been written in this area, both currently in preparation for publication. Uh, one more is being written as we speak uh, by Zen Hess, who's here today. Um, all of them breaking important new ground. Moreover, three Baylor graduate students have published articles in this area. Uh, and I have published two articles with one more to appear later this month and hopefully a little book to emerge in the next uh, few years. So if I had the superpower of prophecy back in 2016, I would have seen all this uh, burgeoning work uh, on the horizon and insisted that a chapter on this topic should be included in check. But since I didn't, perhaps you'll allow me to indulge in an analysis of where we currently are in this uh, rich field of study, in a sense, to make up for my sin of omission. So, Greco-Roman associations. <laughs> In the Greco-Roman world, social collectives frequently formed, offering people venues to enhance their connectivity with others and reinforce their sense of self-worth and significance within their social world. Those groups called themselves by different descriptors, but because of the considerable resemblances evident among these groups, they are frequently heuristically grouped in scholarly parlance under the term associations. For historians, associations offer glimpses of ancient corporate life and how it was organized. Notably, uh, the most interest in this area has been generated by scholars finding associations to provide comparanda for the study of Jewish groups and early Christ groups in the Roman world. In other words, it is the schol it's scholars of early Christianity and the New Testament in particular, that have been driving a good part of this resurgence of interest in Greco-Roman associations. Their argument has been that an, uh, the anachronistic influences of our modern imaginations have all too often shaped our theorizing about the organizational character of early Christ assemblies, and that this is best avoided by training our imaginations about what was feasible for group life within that world as evidenced in the associational database of that world. In this very abbreviated presentation, I offer some thoughts about one or two issues of significance in this growth area, in particular issues of economic viability for associational and early Christ groups. Um, before I begin though, let me say that if you hear me utter a note of light, <clears throat> light criticism here or there, um, know that I have complete respect for everyone that I interact with here. Uh, each one of them has scholarly skills that make me green with envy. 
So first, uh, a case study. I'll improvise this one. The associational origins of the Thessalonian Christ Assembly. Back in 2003, a book emerged um, by Richard Ascoff, Paul's Macedonian Associations, the Social Context of Philippians and One Thessalonians. Um, and Ascoff argues in this book uh, quite forcefully um, that the Thessalonian Christ Christian community emerged from um, a, an occupational association in Thessalonica um, that had been converted en masse to a new deity. Uh, and so what their one, mo their one month they are uh, an occupational group, the next month they have converted to have a new uh, deity at, uh, leading them in a sense, and things are starting to happen. It makes sense of the text of 1 Thessalonians in key ways, and I think is a real improvement over other models of, what, uh, of understanding the origins of the Thessalonian community. But I've also argued that it's not quite refined enough, um, so I've uh, published uh, w one article on this already where I use the phrase associational rupture. And I talk about the association being the parent organization or uh, uh, the occupational association being the apparent association from which the Christ assembly emerges as the original association ruptures in half or two-thirds to one-third or however you want to think about it. Uh, and this, does even, this makes even better sense of the text of 1 Thessalonians in several ways. So that came out uh, previously, and this is coming out um, in a month or so, or the rupture of an association, I think, is a better model. So we don't need to go into that other than just to say, I'll use this as a case study uh, at one or two points um, later in this uh, talk. So <clears throat> socioeconomic levels, membership fees, and informal groups. The study of Greco-Roman associations as providing a heuristic frame of reference for interpreting early Christ groups has proven to be especially fruitful with regard to how early Christ groups may have sustained themselves economically. In this regard, let me dig right into the recent history of a debate about the socioeconomic levels of Christ groups and associations, respectively a debate that I have participated in a little bit over the years. In my 2010 book, Remember the Poor, I proposed that there was a difference in the economic profile of associations in general and urban Christ groups. Drawing upon the work of classical scholars John Patterson and Ono Van Neef, I'm not sure I'm exactly pronouncing his name right, but I'll go with it that way. My point was that associational members generally came from the middling economic groups of the Greco-Roman world, while Christ groups seem to have been somewhat lower down on the economy scale. Of course, some members of Christ groups were among the middling economic groups uh, individually, but the pros uh, prosopography of Christ groups in general seems to have been one or two rungs lower on the economy scale. Two observations, Patterson and Van Neef's placement of associations among middling economic groups was an important corrective to some of the scholarship from the late 19th century and beyond, which frequently depicted associations as populated by members from impoverished sectors of society whose membership gave them little more than funerary insurance. And second, in his blockbuster book, Christ's Associations, from 2019, John Kloppenborg notes that Patterson and Van Neef researched associations only in one particular geographical area, so their work cannot be used as indicative of associations everywhere. Let me, uh, and on that point, he then uh, criticizes me for uh, relying on their, on their data um, as, uh, as, my, as my sole uh, data point. Let me acknowledge that Kloppenborg is right. Their data should not be used to extrapolate more widely. But it should also be noted that I was not alone in this regard back in 2010. A co-authored publication from 2011 also cites Van Neef explicitly to support the same point I was making. Uh, the authors of that volume conclude that the entrance fees required to gain membership into Greco-Roman associations, quote, would represent significant charges that were probably beyond the means of many of the urban poor, 
Um, for these authors, the cost of associational membership fees suggest, here's another quote, a membership of persons with access to at least middling wealth. These quotes are from the introduction to the first volume of the multi-volume series called Greco-Roman Associations. This volume published in 2011, written by two of my friends, uh, Richard Askoff, there he is, and watch this space, wait for it, John Kloppenborg. <laughs> Of course, I, pl I applaud scholars who change their mind uh, in view of fresh, a fresh look of the evidence. And to his credit, Kloppenborg is not averse to admitting in, in print where he has changed his mind or got things wrong in the past. I just wish that in his criticism of my argument, my friend John would have noted that he too held precisely the same view in 2011 that he was criticizing me for holding in 2010. But no matter. Um, the point for our purposes today is that between 2011 and 2019, Kloppenborg changed his mind significantly, and the same is true for me. What was happening between 2010, 2011, and 2019 to account for this significant shift in perspective. To make a long story short, somewhere around 2010, people started looking for data from low-level associations. The best place to spot that initiative is the contributions by uh, a scholar called Richard Last, both on his own and together with another scholar, Sarah Rollins, um, both of them worked with Kloppenborg, did their doctorates in Toronto on, under his supervision. In their 2014 article, Last and Rollins offered an in-depth study and the first English translation of 12 papyrus fragments found in the Egyptian sands that reveal the financial dealings and group life of a low-level association. Last went on to include the gist of that article in his SNTS monograph of uh, 2016, which itself was a reworking of his 2013 PhD dissertation. That monograph went further in foregrounding another important collection of papyrus fragments from the sands of Egypt. Those papyri include the extant ledgers of an association that comprised about 10 members um, all of whom were enslaved. The fee-paying members of this association were certainly not among the middling socioeconomic levels. The accounting ledgers of this small association reveal the intersection of relationality and the use of financial resources at the most inconspicuous of social levels, including a rare glimpse of the agency of the enslaved. By introducing these low-level comparanda into the conversation about Christ groups, the course of our conversation has changed. Things that were said in 2010 and 2011 by Longnecker, Kloppenborg, and Askoff can no longer be said, or at least require so much qualification that it's hardly worth the effort in the first place. Notice, though, what this does not necessarily mean Although we catch occasional glimpses of people forming associations, even at the lowest levels of the economy scale, it cannot be said that whenever people got together, even at the lowest levels of the economy scale, they therefore formed associations. Last seems to suggest precisely this. He intimates that since the lowest socioeconomic levels are represented within the associational database, and since we can't, in a sense, imagine anything lower other than uh, perhaps utter destitution, uh, we can therefore assume that Christ groups would have formed associations from the start. The argument is not um, wholly compelling. If we find a group in the ancient record, we still have to discern, if possible, what kind of a group we're looking at. And I don't mean what kind of association, I mean, are we looking at an associational group or another kind of group? Here I reference a point made by Kloppenborg and others regarding group life in the Greco-Roman world. In the third volume of Greco-Roman associations from 2020, um, so a volume that has nothing to do with Christ groups, but is a collection of texts and, uh, tr and translates them and uh, interprets them, 
Klopp, uh, from associations in that world, Kloppenborg speaks of a sliding scale of group life. He outlines two different levels of associational life as well as non-associational life, um, non-associational group life, what he calls informal groups, groups that we might say were perpetually or otherwise in a state of organizational infancy or under development. Another, another scholar, uh, Conrad Verboven, has encouraged us to consider the conditions under which an informal group might decide to establish itself as a formal organization and to maintain itself as such going forward. Informal groups, groups could meet without necessarily feeling the urgency of forming an association. This means that when we see a low-level group in a text written to early Christ groups, we should not automatically assume that we have an associational group in front of us. In fact, at times the question might not be so much whether, about whether early Christ groups were more like associations or informal groups, but um, even perhaps whether a more complicated scenario might also have been an option. This impression uh, might gain support from Tertullian's description of Christ groups known to him, with some Christ followers donating to the common fund, uh, not unlike associational membership fees, while others did not, depending on their ability and willingness. So let's take a moment and consider the Thessalonian Christ group in relation to associations, informal groups, and occasion, uh, organizationally mixed groups. If there ever was an early Christ group that had organized itself into an association, the place to start looking would be the Thessalonian Christ group, whose original members had recently been embedded within an occupational uh, association. I have already out outlined the ruptured um, association uh, scenario. Um, there, just to remind you of that. Um, uh, that best explains their origins. So was it business as usual when it came to the financial structures of this breakaway group? This, it seems to me, is unlikely, not least because the original members were no longer meeting once a month, but now in preparation for the return of their Lord once per week. At least that's the impression given no matter where we look in the data pertaining to early Christ groups. If all other things were left unchanged, that single adjustment, meeting weekly, would have uh, had considerable financial implications. Uh, very new financial pressures were placed on the Thessalonian Christ Assembly at a very early stage of its existence, and it is unlikely that resolving those pressures could feasibly uh, have involved increasing their membership by four times the amount they had been paying when they were members of the parent association. Some other economic model must have been adopted uh, by that group. So. Uh, imagining predictability for meals in informal settings. When envisioning scenarios for the funding of corporate meals in early Christ assemblies, the distinction between associations and informal groups is a significant conceptual differentiation and needs to be kept fir firmly in mind. It is notable that while Kloppenborg makes this distinction in his 2020 volume, uh, volume, volume three of this series, as we've already said, um, there is no mention of it in his influential 2019 book, Christ Associations. Perhaps this is simply because, as Kloppenborg makes clear in that book, his project in that book is simply heuristic, asking what light might be shed on Christ groups from the data pertaining uh, to Greco-Roman associations themselves. That's a perfectly acceptable project to undertake but I would have thought that the heuristic task he sets out to undertake would be better framed by a recognition that informal groups were also part of the ancient world, coexisting alongside the numerous examples of associational life that Kloppenborg so, frequent, so fruitfully engages with. Arguably, this innocent but significant obscuring of informal groups affects Kloppenborg's results at one key point in his analysis of early Christ groups. 
In his important chapter on meals, chapter nine of Christ's associations, Kloppenborg tests different theories as to how Christ groups may have funded their meals. And by the way, having almost run out of PowerPoint visuals, here's something that you can enjoy. Um, a fresco from Pompeii recently uncovered last year, depicting a meal plate. <laughs> Um, in a heavy-hitting section, Kloppenborg demolishes any notion that an external patron could be supplying the economic resources for every associational meal. External patrons can be shown to provide the funds for some associational meals, but there is no, no evidence that they funded all the meals. Four monthly meals per year is about the most the data ever suggests, and even that is a high watermark. The rest of the associational meals were funded by other means, that is, by membership fees and by provisions supplied by the elected leaders, often on a rotating basis, with financial costs being part of the recognized responsibilities of those leaders. This is all the more evident when we keep in view the Egyptian Slave Association mentioned earlier, which probably had no external patron but still managed to maintain its economic viability exclusively by means of membership fees and leadership contributions. Consequently, Kloppenborg's clarification of the situation gives him some legroom to reevaluate the question of how the meals of Christ groups were funded. In, Kloppen in Kloppenborg's view, uh, the meals shared by Christ followers must have been funded by membership fees and the responsibilities that inevitably came with the roles of elected leadership. Let me confirm that I find Kloppenborg's proposals historically viable, especially in any instances where Christ groups organize themselves as formal associations. Somewhere along the line, I have disavowed myself of the notion that membership fees would have been cancerous to the theological DNA of Christ groups. But uh, another option is also historically viable, that is, the meals of Christ groups may often have operated on a bring-your-own-meal basis. More, a more scholarly term for these meals would be Aaronistic, <coughs> although the term is not perfectly suitable in some regards. Kloppenborg discusses this interpretive option, knowing that Aaronistic meals were a part of everyday life in the Greco-Roman world. Key writers from the Greek world attest to it, as do Roman writers as well. But Kloppenborg excludes this option from consideration with regard to Christ groups. On what basis? Because such meals have no foothold in the associational data. Let me say that again. <laughs> Why are BYO meals excluded as an option for helping us think about the meals of Christ groups? And the answer is, those meals are not relevant to the conversation because they have no foothold in the associational database. Here we have a rare instance where Kloppenborg's generally productive project might be seen to misfire. While Kloppenborg repeatedly proves his claim that associations are good to think with when studying early Christ groups, in this instance, he seems to spin the claim to mean that associations are the only form of group life with which to think. In this instance, thinking with associations has morphed into don't think beyond associations, despite the fact that relevant data might lie there. The reasoning seems circular. Although data from certain types of formal associations are bound to be predominant in our conversations, we need to be more intentional in considering what informal groups might also have looked like, allowing us to do more of a triangulated comparison. It would not be hard to imagine such informal groups engaging in some kind of a BYO meal practice. In fact, it's probably precisely here where the divergence between informal and associational groups are most, is most obvious. Since our overarching concern is to allow contours of ancient group life to illuminate our interpretations of early Christ groups, Aaronistic meals cannot be excluded as an option in our historical reconstruction of the various kinds of groups evident in that world. 
Unlike the Thessalonian Christ group, it might be that small and young Christ groups often started as informal groups. When a small group of people adopting a fledgling Christ devotion in the pagan world of the first century uh, got together, they probably did not say, before we can meet together, we must elect a president and a treasurer, and we must decide upon a membership fee and a scale of financial fines. Measures of that kind were usually further down the road of organizational maturity, a process that would have looked different in each case at various speeds and in various configurations. Now, Kloppenborg rightly highlights that group life needed economic predictability. That is, groups needed to be able to ensure in advance that a meal was going to be properly resourced. And Kloppenborg rightly demonstrates that in associations, membership fees and donations by leaders were the means of ensuring the viability of associational meetings. But uh, almost by definition, informal groups had neither of those measures. Um, there must have been other ways of ensuring a meeting's viability when uh, informal groups are under consideration. If we imagine that some Christ groups were not yet associational but were still informal, how can we imagine their meals being financially viable occasions? First, we need to be clear about what such meals might have included. Kloppenborg recounts that associational meals were generally not sumptuous. He articulates the point this way. A survey of the menus of Roman collegia, or associations, confirms that in most cases the menu was simple. Bread and wine with occasional additions of figs or sardines. The point of the meal was not to dine sumptuously, he says, but to see oneself as dining with the group and to let others see it as well. So associational mean, meals then were not extravagant, dripping with foodstuffs of all kinds. With that in view, how might we imagine meals among any Christ groups that weren't yet fully associational? Perhaps we should assume that Christ groups uh, met weekly on the Lord's Day and celebrated a meal or love feast as part of those weekly meetings. For informal groups of Christ followers, it's not hard to imagine that most of the meals were supplied in the bring-your-own arrangements we would expect of informal groups. Uh, the supplies for those meals might have come primarily through household arrangements. Um, before I get there, let me change the slide. This is a, an artist drawing of a fresco found in Pompeii. It's very faint, I'm sorry. It shows a family um, on the left uh, buying a meal, um, and uh, on the right, others eating a meal in an informal setting. So it's that informal setting I'm capturing here, as well as the purchasing meal, the meal from the, the, the uh, corner store. We can easily imagine that on the Lord's Day, a Christ-following household might not have eaten within the household premises for one particular and predetermined meal. Instead, for that meal, the household simply moved a few foodstuffs to the predetermined location to eat with other Christ followers. This bring-your-own arrangement would have had no effect on the household finances. If they were not meeting with other Christ followers, the member of the household, members of the households would have been fed within the household or, as in this Pompeii fresco, in some nearby location. There would have been virtually no economic adjustments in this bring-your-own scenario. As long as we keep things organized around households, the modeling is very simple. But of course, there might well have been some in the Christ group who were not embedded in one of the Christ-following households. Say, a few former slaves recently freed and now forging relationships beyond the household of their former enslavers. But even here, the scenario does not complicate things much, since most of these people are involving themselves in a bring-your-own situation where they simply provide for themselves as they would have done anyway. The difference is that they were eating their meal with, uh, with a broader gathering of people. There's much flexibility in the bring-your-own scenario. There might even have been a temporal variable with all the Christ followers in a particular city meeting together only once per month, perhaps, following a regular associational model and meeting in various smaller informal groups in households or other venues 
for the other 40 weeks of the year. Notice that none of this transgresses Kloppenborg's important point that meal contributions needed to be su sufficiently predictable to prevent gatherings from degrading into disarray. The only situations where a BYO model introduces instability involves the utterly destitute and or some of the enslaved who might join the meal on their own unaccompanied by their enslavers and or households. But it would not be difficult to maintain a viable economic predictability even with these participants joining the informal group if it was understood in advance of the meal that other members would willingly share a little of what they had, of what they had brought or that they would bring a little extra to the gathering to provide provisions for such people. To imagine this happening is not to engage in Christian exceptionalism. Forms of generosity of precisely this kind are evident within the database of associations that had nothing to do with Christ's devotion. We have an example of precisely this in that low-level association of Egyptian slave men that I've already mentioned. In that association, uh, one member is seen paying the membership fee for someone else when that other member was experiencing financial difficulties. If that sort of thing was happening in low-level associations, it isn't hard to imagine a similar form of generosity being built into the general expectations of informal groups, including any early Christ groups that might qualify for that designation. The same would also be true for any organizationally mixed groups of the kind that Tertullian mentions. What Kloppen, with Kloppenborg's recognition of the existence of informal groups beyond associations, and his recognition that bring your own meals were a feature of group life beyond associations, all I have done here is connect the dots that Kloppenborg leaves for us for any Christ groups that were not constituted as formal associations. No doubt any Christ group that was not or not yet formally uh, an association <clears throat> needed to make decisions regarding the organization and expectations of meal situations. But what we seem to be seeing for informal groups is an economic environment that often differs from what is virtually ubiquitous in the data that John and others have so helpfully assembled from the database of Greco-Roman associations. In short, that data is extremely helpful in any number of ways, but um, the, the data from the associational um, in inscriptions is extremely helpful in any number of ways, but uh, it should not be used to restrict our historical imaginations unnecessarily. The modeling of ancient informal group life needs always to be kept in view as a viable option for heuristic comparison. Final words. Um, David Wilhite's two introductory essays in Czech offer an optimistic vision for the future of the discipline. I'm sure he's right about that, uh, and I would bet that the, that the new Cambridge History of Ancient Christianity, published in, let's say, 2043, um, co-edited by David Wilhite and someone else who's alive at that time, uh, <laughs> will include uh, a chapter on Greco-Roman associations and early Christ groups as one of the gross growth points uh, in the discipline. Three words of thanks. First of all, thank you, David Wilhite, for your many efforts to make Czech what it is. It was a great pleasure working with you on it, and our friendship has only grown and been strengthened. Let's do a meal again soon. <laughs> thanks again, Philip, for putting, me, uh, putting this day together, allowing me to air some thoughts and conf confess my sins. <laughs> and finally, thanks to all of you who've come uh, for your patience and attention. So now the fun starts. What should we talk about? <laughs> Zen. How are you and David going to fund your meal? <laughs> Question. I was hoping you're the patron, not a BYO. BYO, BYOM, or? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> was there a follow-up to that? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Good. Robin. This has nothing to do with association, so I apologize in advance, but I, I'm thinking about meals and contributions to the destitute. And I'm thinking about the tradition, I think, and I'm sure 
David may know more about this than I do, but about leaving food and after the funeral meal at the site of the burial for the people who come and take food. I just wonder if that has any legs to think about with contributions of food to those who can't otherwise bring it. Wow. That's interesting. I, I know nothing about that tradition. That's yeah, it's, it's pretty well established that, you know, that they would leave, the, and not just in Christian groups, or right. Christ follower groups, if you want, but uh, generally, that it was kind of um, practice to leave it there, and then people would come into the cemeteries to gather food. Well, yeah. I, I don't know if it has any relevance, but I just thought it was that's, that's that. very helpful. Thank you. I'll, I'll need to think about that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, go ahead, Dean Still. Bruce, uh, thank you very much. Fascinating. I can't wait to get your articles on uh, I know. NPS and JBL. You're the Thessalonians, man. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm particularly interested in seeing you establish how the uh, Thessalonian congregation emerged from associations. But we'll leave that to one side. Um, have you um, thought about um, uh, Robert Jewett's uh, proposal in his Thessalonian correspondence, published 1986, where he uh, commends a kind of potluck. Mm -hmm. um, he envisions that they meet in tenements, not in homes, so they're uh, down on the social order. And uh, that's if two Thessalonians pertains, mm -hmm. uh, that's why we get the admonition. Uh, let not the one, uh, uh, the one who does not work, neither let this one eat. So I wonder how that comes into play uh, in your reconstruction. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, what I just presented is sort of like, I'm just an old man and I don't like what the new stuff, the new boys are <laughs> doing, right? I just want to go back to the old, the old, the old ways. Um, but what I, so in many ways, what I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with you at, on this, that this is a wholly viable uh, yeah. scenario. And, um, and, and, and uh, but I'm getting back to it using Kloppenborg's own breadcrumbs to gotcha. get me there. <laughs> and yep. that's the trick, because um, otherwise he'll just say, you know, it, he will, as he does, he just, it's not a, it, it's, you, you can't, yeah, you, you just have to use the, the associational database to reconstruct what's going on. And it doesn't seem to me and to others in this room that he's doing the joined up thinking in that regard. And the joined up thinking does take us back to some earlier forms of imagination. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if 1 Corinthians pertains, then uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 17, and that which follows. Well, he's got a different reading of all that, of course. I'm sure. But, um, yeah, I mean... The, the question is, how does the text resonate the best in relation to this scenario and that scenario? Yeah, yeah. And still food involved. Still food involved. He would say what's gone wrong is they're not, Then help me out. Over to you. What, do, what would he say? It, sorry, in which one? What, what would Kloppenborg say, yeah, in chapter 9 on the meals? Uh, we'll get the conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to recall exactly. I've been... I've been Right, yeah. With you on Thessalonians because I've been writing on that. That's right, you're on that track. Um, but, but Corinthians, uh, yeah, he deals with this in the, um, his whole discussion on membership dues. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't want to really go down the route that the problem is that there's a, a, a constituency within Corinth that actually has nothing, um, but that it's got something more to do with um, kind of a disorderly practice of distribution. They're not right. really following their own bylaws, whether he, I, I, don't, I think, and he, yeah. he's cautious and, yes. and judicious in how he puts all of this. He, he right. doesn't really land <laughs> in a firm point uh, in, in certain ways that make it a little slippery to fight back on or argue back on. Um, but I think he would, he would chalk it up to being, there are people who are paying dues and not getting the meal distributed that they have they deserve by their own rights within the group. It's, it's how I recall him putting it, but good. correct that if I'm wrong. Yeah, really good. And so, so for him, the real problem is a lack of predictability. And he doesn't quite say what the, you know, we think he, we know what he's saying, but I'm, I'm, right. he's left a little bit of room for him, for, for vague, vagueness here. But the real problem is the Corinthians are not operating on a basis of, of economic predictability. And for whatever reason, Paul is basically saying, stick to your reg reg uh, re um, regulations, <laughs> basically. 
stick to what you had agreed in advance. It's awfully difficult when you have outsiders coming in, like in 1 Corinthians 14. So it's hard to know how many beans to put in the pot. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there are readings of 1 Corinthians where, for instance, Richard Last wants to see the whole thing as associational from start to finish. And Paul's even talking about your elected leaders um, and, and things of this sort. And, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a robust reading. It makes you ask whether we've been off track all these years. But there's going to be some pushback, too. Yeah. Mike. I have two questions, I think. Thank you. That was... Uh... Less looking in the rearview mirror and more looking down the road. But not fair well, if you look in the rearview mirror for too long, you're going to have trouble. So I wanted to look down the road a little bit too. <laughs> you don't want to go off the road all the time. Yeah. Uh, you may have said this, and I think I wasn't listening closely enough. Oh, I was missing the significance of it. An informal group. Is there a definition of an informal group? I mean, what, what does that mean? And what is the comparanda of an informal group? I mean, the nice thing about the association is You've got all this this material that's been gathered. What what is an informal group, and what beyond just a group that's getting together? I mean, can you say more about how you define that, and where you find the evidence of that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I I think those Greek authors that that uh, he and others reference, the Roman authors, where people are just getting together were for these potluck or bring your own meals, are are clues to those sort of informal groups, but also just. It's sort of common sense in a, I mean, but what is the definition? But whenever we imagine people getting together um, who, who aren't an association, who have a, something in common are saying, let's meet in the palestra, you know, tomorrow at noon and we'll just bring our lunch, you know, bring your lunch and we'll have it, we'll have some fun, you know? And it's, I think it's, it's simply that. Some people even imagine slaves getting together, you know, outside of, working hours or whatever. I mean, it's really hard to press our understanding, but we do have that slave association where, and I've done some work in that, and I think what we're seeing is, uh, was it three or four? I don't remember now. How, slaves from three, let's say, how, different households coming together. Now that's an organizational feat because when are, when are their masters gonna allow them to come together at different times? So um, now I've changed the topic here, but I think the same sort of thing is probably going on just in informal meals. We've got something in common. I'd love to know more about you. Let's have lunch. Okay, so here's my second. Yeah. So, so in terms of scenarios, it sounds like you could have some uh, Christ assemblies that emerge out of associations that can, and continue and have rules and regulations, etc. Uh, the one that ruptures out of Thessalonians, does that, does that continue to be an association or does it become an informal group? I guess that's another question. But then I think you hinted at informal groups that might morph into association type, that, that is they form. That sounds almost like the organizational um, aspect of the move from sect to church, I mean to use that kind yeah. of language, or into early Catholicism. Now you've got organization that follows some informal groups. Mm -hmm. So that's another type. And then I guess there's the informal, like the tenement house that just stays informal. Mm -hmm. That's like three or four different right. ways. Is that, I mean, is that, you're comfortable with that? An, uh, an informal group may or may not become an association. An association mm -hmm. may continue to be an association of Christ followers. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, Thessalon uh, in the Thessalonian group that goes from structure to, I think, is a more, more a less, informal. more of an informal, it's a mixed organizational okay, model. So you've got that model as well. And I think they're all, I just think they're all, we ha they all have to be in play. And my guess is that if, if we could count them up, the number of Christ groups that are formal associations in the first century, is going to be few. few and far. I mean, I, well, you we know. Have no I mean, there's, it's, the, that's the, the professional data yeah. has so, so much of it is these, these rules and regulations, et cetera, which is uh, remarkably missing from the Christian. I mean, maybe it just didn't survive. Who wants to keep the list of rules, you know, your bylaws or whatever, but. Yeah. But that is missing altogether. Yeah, yeah. That's unless, right. you, unless you, I think, I think some of them think you see some evidence of it in, in the, the, the epistle. So the Pauline communities represent all of these different scenarios, possibly. Very, very well, could I mean, if that's you know, so that he's not concerned about how that. Uh, if the message of Jesus can get a foothold in any context, let's work it. 
and you guys work indigenously in that. Make sure you've got the fruit of the spirit to make to ensure that it doesn't go wrong and it becomes a power ploy for whatever. But you know, but as long as the fruit of the spirit is there, you know, or the mind of Christ or whatever you want to talk about. The organizational the organizational uh, uh, the organizational community probably uh, manifested in particular problems. That is, an association will have problems that an informal group wouldn't have. So that you've got, mm -hmm. that's an interesting yeah. uh, grid with, with, within which to read the yeah. all, all on yeah. material. Yeah, exactly right. I think he would say, I mean, I think Paul would say, in, you know, he would work with the indigenous structures that are taking shape on the ground in whatever way that, it's great though, all those different models. I think he, they're all in play. Yeah. So good, good. I was going to ask, how can, I'm fascinated by this kind of case study that you mentioned that we can take from what we've seen Thessalonians. Um, what would you say about us, what would you say about the church, what could the church today learn from this sort of case study that you spoke of? From past associations, like these meals, what do you think the church today could take? Um, oh, that's a terrific question. Um, one is the embeddedness of Christian identity within the culture. It's going to look different in each and every age, and um, that's okay. I mean, I, I, so, I mean, we've had some conversations in, in, about this, you know, that, uh, you know, um, that what we do in today's churches often fits our cultural context really nicely. Is that bad? No, you know, it's just, so I don't know, something along those lines is maybe where I would go. Great question, though. But it's also about the corporate identity, the sense of belonging. I mean, Koppenborg's subtitle is connecting and belonging, or belonging and connecting, connecting and belonging in. And we could say, you know, that, although that's, that has nothing to, you know, the, the associational identity as collecting and belonging, um, it's not necessarily anything Christian. Nonetheless, what we see in Christ groups is, is, is uh, re requires that as the, at the as the sort of lowest starting point that you build from, you know, that sense of connect connection and belonging. Can I go to Robert? Thank you very much. Uh, can I go to Robin and then uh, Philip? Two things really quickly. Again, coming from left field, so I'm sorry. Oh. I love it. But one thing is to think about, and I think you I think you know this, but just to sort of think that slavery in the Roman world can include very high-level slaves with a lot of money to spend. I mean, they're not necessarily right. under the dominer, dominance of a, of a slave owner. They might have a lot of freedom and a lot of even some cash. Right. Um, and then so, and certainly for freedmen women as well. But then the other thing I was thinking about in the terms of this, in thinking about Christian associations, um, Rodney Stark's work, mm -hmm. and when he mm. thinks about the other sorts of forms that associations provide, not just meals, but also other ways of helping, and he uses the Mormons as his model, right? But so how that spreads. Self-care. Yeah. Yeah, all yeah. kinds of care. I'm just yeah. thinking of that included in, th or just thinking mostly about meals. Yeah, care, but yeah exactly. There's a lot of intra-communal care of people in need within associations. Mm -hmm. What, what um, I have trouble finding is a real impetus for caring for those beyond the group. Whereas, so if we're going to talk about yeah. Christian discourse, um, I don't want to go the route of Christian exceptionalism, but there are distinctives in every association. And what you see in Christ group collectives is often a kind of discourse of caring for those even beyond the group membership. So it does seem to be a distinctive um, of, of some forms of Christ groups in that yeah, regard. I was just thinking of, I mean, there's yeah. a case, I think, in um, the plague, and Cyprian's talking about that Christians are caring for people and they sure. become immune because they... Yeah. <clears throat> right. I think Julian, the, uh, the Emperor Julian, gets upset for Christians are converting people because they're so charitable or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. I yeah. don't That's right, yeah. That's right. And, and your first point was simply exactly the slaves are all different kinds. The, the Egyptian slave association, it's clear from their ledgers that these are pretty impoverished slaves. I mean, they can't even supply wine for their, for their associational gatherings sometimes. Sometimes it's just uh, uh, fruit, grape juice. 
Um, good Baptist. Yeah, good Baptist. <laughs> Every now and then they dip into the wine. It comes wine with about 15 minutes of being out in the heat. But anyway. <laughs> That's right. Um, Phil, did you want, did you have something too? Philip. Just a very quick response there. <clears throat> if you know the Alpha course, the P in Alpha stands for pasta, which is the, the, the uh, universal, the idea of uh, food as what brings people together for this very large evangelistic activity, which claims <clears throat> what is now some 20 million participants. Wow, yeah. But it's based around pasta. Yeah, that's neat. <laughs> Maybe one last one? Uh, oh, sorry. Well, oh, my goodness. Uh, we, we, we can't go much beyond one more question, if okay. that's okay. I saw Zen a while back. Maybe yeah, Zen? I think one of the things that is, has not yet been explored, but Josiah Hall, whose publication you mentioned, uh, pushed for this, and I think it was Richard Last at SBL this year pushed for this. It's always been a one, so far in the past eight years, or however long we've been uh, kind of on this, It's it's mainly been unidirectional, um, or I guess one, just going in one direction, we look at association stuff and ask how association data helps us read New Testament texts. I'm curious about your thoughts on the reverse, which Hall and Last have both in, encouraged us to start thinking about. If we're going to imagine that these Christ groups are associations or are analogous to associations enough to be read in light of them, um, what does it look like to ask how the Christ groups give us data about associations? That's, that's nice. Let's think more on that. I, I mean, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that what we see in the Corinthian Christ group with, in relation to women and w women's experience uh, can, can, sh can shed helpful light or at least help us ask better questions of the uh, what's called the um, Villa of the Mysteries in Pompeii, where we see female experience in relation to uh, the Dionysiac uh, mystery religion. And uh, it seems to me that they're not a world away from each other. And the funny thing is when I read Pompeian scholars on the Villa of the Mysteries, I'm kind of saying, I think you could sharpen your question a little bit because of what I think I know is going on in the yeah. Corinthian community. So that's not a very good question in terms of a, or, or answer in terms of a, like a, 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 an overview of how we could do this, but it's a little example of what we might sort of see at times. Yeah, thank you very much. We'll uh, draw to um, an end there, and uh, there will be an opportunity to ask uh, more questions at the end of the afternoon when we have a kind of a group uh, meeting. Uh, uh, bring your own food at that point. Right. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And we're going to take a break there, and uh, we can you be back here at um, one fifteen, please? Okay. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks,